The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Kara Ustros here with realagriculture.com. We are back here today with another Canola School episode and I have here with me Hector Carcamo, who is a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge, Alberta. How's it going today? Good morning. I'm doing quite well. Happy to be here. Absolutely. So we are here today to talk about Ligus bugs. Ligus is an area of your research that you've really been focusing on lately and this year um, being it dry across the prairies for the most part, there's been a lot of ligus bugs. Do you want to expand on that? Yes, uh, ligus bugs are a very interesting pest. Uh, they happen to be a native species. So ligus bugs have been here before feeding on, on various plants. And when we started uh, doing agriculture, they found that uh, some of our crops are very, very attractive to them. And uh, those crops include pretty much all the broadleaf crops, canola, alfalfa, including seed alfalfa, forage alfalfa, flax, fava beans, lentils, the list goes on and on. In fact, if you, if you uh, sweep in cereal crops, you will even find some ligus there. And ligus bugs this year has been a, a very unusual year, I think because of the weather conditions. We have ligus bugs and we have outbreaks from coast to coast, the species that we have also are different. The number of generations that we have are different. They are a little bit more complicated to study and to, to manage, but uh, it is possible to manage them. <laughs> so when you're looking in canola specifically, what is what is damage look like and what part of the, the stage of the crop are you really going to see that damage? Okay, um, I guess it's important to understand the biology of ligus a little bit. So they, the ligus bugs, they overwinter as adults in tree shelters, uh, field margins, and then they will start uh, flying and feeding on whatever plants they find in the spring. Like they could feed on the weeds, flixweed, and when that plant matures, then the ligus adults will start flying all over the place and they seem to just fall like rain on the fields. 2021 has been a very different year, as we all know. We've had this uh, heat that has continued for a long time. It was a very, it has been very dry, so the crop is more, more vulnerable, and it looks like the ligus populations are, are much better synchronized with the crops this year. So we have seen a very large influx of ligus into canola, the early flowers. So we have seen numbers of uh, two or three ligus per sweep, which which we have not seen before. And given the dry, hot conditions, I guess there was potential for ligus to damage the crops. Although normally they wouldn't damage the crop or flower. Canola is a very good crop as far as compensating for insect damage. If canola gets a little bit of rain, it will do well and compensate for ligus. So what damage do they do? Uh, they will cause uh, abortion of the pods. So you will see the, the flowers will be blasted and uh, you will see gaps in the, in the main raceme at that time. However, you could also see that kind of damage from heat stress. So it's a little bit difficult to distinguish ligus from heat stress at the time. But normally, if it's insect damage, you're not going to see an entire missing gap of uh, pods. So you will, because insects do not take everything. You know, they're, they're uh, not so selfish that they will eat everything and leave you nothing. So they will, they will hit a pod here, another there, and so on. So you will see some well-formed pods and flowers and some that are will that will be uh, absent in the same length of the racine. So that's one, one clue that uh, you can distinguish heat stress from insect damage. So when you're going uh, at this time of year, when you know, you're, you're out of flowering, but you're kind of, your crop's changing and it's turning, what, what sorts of thresholds are out there right now for the ligus? That is the key question, I guess. What is the threshold for, uh, for ligus bugs? And whenever we talk about thresholds, we have to remember something really important that we have to keep in mind the crop stage, right? Because there's no such thing as just a threshold for an insect pest in a crop. You always have to think of the threshold and the crop stage. For ligus bugs, the threshold is uh, two or three ligus per sweep. This is the new threshold that we are recommending. So the threshold that we are recommending of uh, two or three ligus per sweep at the end of flowering that is the time when you should be monitoring the crop very intensively and, and considering uh, uh, managing the crop. 
and how do you know what, that the uh, LIGOs are causing damage at the time? You can actually visually confirm that by walking through the field and if you're coming out with your pants full of sticky stuff when the uh, crop is oozing from the pods that will be an indication that the LIGOS boats are actually causing damage and you are going to see that at the, uh, in the middle of the day when you have a very hot day at, at the peak time when temperatures are high you're going to see the, the, uh, the crop oozing out of the pods from the feeding punctures of LIGOS boats so that will be an indication that you're seeing damage the other thing you can do at this time when the crop is at the, uh, you know, at the harvesting stage almost close to swathing time you can actually open the pod and you will see shrunk seeds that will be an indication that LIGOS boats have been feeding on the on the pod. And now, do you want to just, I guess, expand a bit on why it's important that you're still looking before harvest for these LIGOS for the feeding? It might be too late to do anything about it, but can they cause a problem next year? Like you said, they eat so many different broadleafs. Will they, will they cause problems next year if you're seeing them this year? That's a really good question. So, li LIGOS bugs are very unpredictable. You know, and, and this actually happens for many insects also. So, so this year, you know, we have very high LIGOS numbers. Um, are these large populations going to potentially create a problem next year? It's possible, but it's also possible that we will have a very harsh winter that will kill half of them. And it's also possible that in the spring we have a very wet spring that uh, the LIGOS nymphs, the baby LIGOS, they're very vulnerable to rain. So if you get uh, heavy rain at the right time when the LIGOS are babies, that will actually control your LIGOS population. So yes, there is the potential of all these LIGOS going into overwintering and, and having very high numbers. And if we have a, a very mild winter and a very open fall, uh, although there are not too many crops that are green now and they need some something green to feed on to to fatten up to uh, survive the winter so this might not be such a good thing for them you know they might not find a lot of things to feed on during the fall except i have seen them now feeding on kosher flowers and and the seeds so maybe they are feeding on those weeds also so are there any parasitoids out there that you guys are aware of when it comes to lagus bugs bugs that's another excellent question so lagus bugs like any other insects they have natural enemies um Baby ligus, they can be eaten by predators also uh, and, and parasitoids. So natural enemies, there are two general kinds. Well, three general kinds of natural enemies, right? We can think of, uh, of diseases, right? Uh, fungus, viruses attack insects. And in a, if you have a wet spring, you probably will have more fungus that actually attack ligus also, and that reduces their numbers. Uh, baby liguses, they're also eaten by predators like spiders, eat them. Um, there's also these uh, uh, soft flower beetles. There's quite a few insects that actually eat ligus bugs. In fact, even a bigger ligus can eat a small ligus. So I, it, it's, it's not uncommon to have some of these uh, plant bugs related to ligus and ligus themselves that actually are also predators of their own species. So. Yes, there are many natural enemies that attack them and, and fortunately, you know, a, a LIGOS mom can have something like 200 babies, but not all of them actually make it to, to the stage where they actually cause damage. And uh, there are predators that eat the baby LIGOS and it's important to keep those in mind, right? Whenever you spray, you're not just killing the pests, you're also killing the beneficial insects. But, there, but LIGOS bugs also have a, a wasp uh, parasitoid. Uh, there is this, this wasp called Peristinus and it's a very tiny wasp only about three millimeters four millimeters and it will go and grab uh, baby ligos they can only handle second instar so it's a very small ligos that they can attack ligos have five stages so they will attack the second stage we call them instars and they will stick their um, ovipositor it's like the stinger but they don't really sting people they only use it to to penetrate the ligos nymph in the abdomen they lay an egg and out of that egg a larva of the wasp will hatch and it will start consuming the ligus bugs from the inside yes it's this is where the movie alien came from i'm sure but the uh, so the the baby wasp is a like a little little white worm will grow inside and the ligus bug will continue to feed and it will actually feed the parasite at the same time 
and when it becomes uh, a more mature nymph at the uh, fifth instar, so at the end of the juvenile stage, the baby wasp, you know, the larva will reach maturity, will chew a hole, kill the, kill the ligus nymph and exit, and it will pupate in the soil. And then it will stay about 10 months in the soil, and the following year, the uh, wasp adult will come. So it's really important if you're, for example, a seed alfalfa grower, you want to learn when those parasitoids are actually active, flying, looking for ligus nymphs. And they also attack uh, Adelphocoris, the alfalfa plant bug. So you get the benefit of two for one with Peristinus if you're a seed alfalfa grower. So they, they will attack uh, alfalfa plant bug and ligus bugs. And it's really crucial that you don't spray insecticide at the time when these parasitoids are active flying around because then you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot by not allowing the parasitoids to help you control the, the plant bugs. Part of our research is actually to, to um, look for interactions between a, a parasitoid from Europe that has two generations. All our native parasitoids only have one generation, but there is one that goes by the fancy name in Latin. Sorry, we don't have a common name for this. It's called Peristinus digonutus. And this species has been introduced in the northeast U.S., north of New Jersey, and it has moved on its own, didn't bother to get a passport, crossed into Canada, and now it's well established in Quebec and southern Ontario, and it seems to be attacking uh, ligus bugs at high numbers. We don't know if they actually are controlling them, but we are hopeful that they can make a dent eventually. It takes many years usually for the parasitoids to, to establish well and decrease the populations, so our goal in the next few years will be to actually see what parasitoids we have in, in various crops to study the uh, interactions between the native parasitoids and the exotic parasitoids and eventually we, we will come to a conclusion whether it will be uh, first economical, efficacious and environmentally feasible to introduce this new parasitoid into the prairies and potentially help us to manage the ligus bugs in a more permanent way so, so we don't have them flying in the huge numbers that we see this, this year. Okay, sounds good. I look forward to seeing the research. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hector. Thank you.